Good morning, and may I welcome you all to St. Michael's Rand Furley Church in Bridge of Weir for our Sunday service. Whether you are here in person, watching the live stream from home, I am sure that the good Lord will very much appreciate your presence, and indeed, so do I. The minister is on holiday this week, and so for your sins, she has entrusted you to my care for today's service. This hopefully will prove to be a wise decision, but I shall let you make up your own minds about that. Today is the fifth Sunday in Lent, Passion Sunday, and marks the beginning of the period known in the Christian church as Passion Tide. This lasts until Good Friday. As Holy Week approaches, the atmosphere of the season darkens and the cross casts its shadow over the worship of the church. Today's sermon will focus on the condemnation of Jesus. Now, before I start, many of you have been asking why you were given two ribbons at the entrance to the church. Later on, during the prayer of intercession, there will be a special prayer said for the Ukraine, and you are asked to hold these ribbons whilst the prayer is being said. At the conclusion of the service, please take them outside and attach them to the cross at the front door. There's plenty of foliage and bits and pieces to attach them to. Anyway, let us worship God. The psalmist said, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Following on from the theme of Passion Tide, let us sing together hymn 377, hymn 377, Go to Dark Gethsemane. We haven't sung this for a year or two, but you'll recognize the tune. <coughs> Blessed are you, Lord God of our salvation. We gather here this day to worship and praise you. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. As we rejoice in this gift of a new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you and a desire to live in your ways. 
But at this Lenten time, O Lord, we are more conscious than ever of our shortcomings in your eyes. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, through things we have done and things we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have sometimes made promises to you which flourished like flowers in a field, but when the winds of neglect or sin blew over them, they were gone. We have forgotten them. But you, Lord, are forever, and we put our trust in you, for you have promised never to leave us nor forsake us. In your mercy, forgive us, O God, that we may seek your face and be brought by your infinite grace to your holy presence. In the flame of your eternal light, kindle in us the fire of love and renew us with your Holy Spirit. Kiri Elison, Christi Elison, Kiri Elison, let your ways be known upon the earth. Blessed are you, God of compassion and mercy. In the darkness of our sin, your light breaks forth like the dawn, and your healing springs up for deliverance. Let us remind ourselves of our faith by reciting together the prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us hear the word of God. Our Bible reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 1 to 16. Jesus sentenced to be crucified. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from, he asked Jesus. <clears throat> but Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me. Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is G Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover, and it was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. 
May God add his blessing to these readings from his holy word, and to his name be the praise and glory. Let us sing together hymn 399, hymn 399, My Song is Love Unknown, and verses 1, 2, 3, 5, and 7. Some of you have had the doubtful pleasure of listening to. I've often said that I was uncomfortable with either the subject or the narrative on which it was based. It will come as no surprise to you then if I tell you that this is the case again today. Why do I do it, you may ask. Firstly, I feel as if I am doing what the Lord would wish of me. And secondly, I'm too scared of the minister to refuse. If I may explain further, it's a feature of human nature that we always like a story with a happy ending. If we are watching a film, whether it's a police drama, a spy mystery, a war film, or whatever, we always want those we perceive as the goodies to come out and top. When my wife watches one of these atrocious (coughs) romantic stories, she She's always somewhat perturbed if the person she perceives as the heroine marries what she considers to be the wrong man. In sport, we adopt the same mindset. We want the team we support or the players we support to be the winners. But as Christians, we have the greatest good news story of all, the Christmas story. A child is born who went on to become the saviour of the world. The lead up to the great day is both exciting and awe-inspiring. 
Shepherds, wise men get into the act, led by a star. And the long-awaited birth is the topic of discussion in that part of the world for centuries. Jesus and his parents successfully escaped to Egypt to avoid the clutches of wicked King Herod. And the wise men outwit Herod, leaving him in the lurch. As they see nowadays, what's not to like? But then comes Easter. Although the ultimate end to the Easter story is our forgiveness and salvation, what happens prior to Jesus being placed in the tomb from which he subsequently rises does not make for enjoyable reading. If I ever needed a reminder of how cruel and inhumane the human race could be, then this is it. In this morning's passage from John 19, so splendidly read by Sarah, we heard of Jesus' appearance before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. It would probably have been more convenient if we had read the last part of John 18 before we embarked on John 19, as chapter 19 merely continues the narrative of Jesus appearing before Pilate. You will, however, hopefully remember from last week that Jesus, having been detained in the Garden of Gethsemane, was taken before the high priests, Annas, and then Caiaphas, before being referred on to the Roman prefect or governor, Pontius Pilate. Jesus was being questioned by Pilate, who had appeared reluctant to have anything to do with the matter. Jesus answered these questions truthfully, but in a manner unlikely to be understood by Pilate, who was neither an adherent to Christianity nor a Jew. All this was taking place at the time of the Jewish Passover festival, when it was customary for the authorities to release a prisoner from captivity as a goodwill gesture. Pilate informed the crowd of this and even suggested it should be Jesus, as he could not conclude that Jesus had done anything wrong. The crowd, however, chose Barabbas, another prisoner who was apparently a well-known violent rogue and who had, <clears throat> amongst other things, participated in an uprising against Roman rule. <clears throat> Jesus was now in a precarious position. He had been abandoned by his friends and his disciples. He was completely alone. I, ironically, the only person who appears to have been reluctant to condemn him appears to have been Pontius Pilate himself. John's Gospel tells us at this point, Pilate had Jesus flogged. Why was this done? Well, the flogging of a prisoner condemned to crucifixion was normal practice by the Romans, perhaps to weaken the victim in order that he might die more quickly in the cross. Or in other cases, to extract a confession from them or simply to punish them. Jesus, however, was not merely flogged. He was scourged. The flagellum, to give it its Latin name, with which the scourging was carried out, consisted of a wooden handle laced with leather thongs and weighted with lead. It was studded with sharp pieces of bone and small stones. It was inflicted by a Roman centurion. The strokes tore the flesh from a man's back, often exposing muscle and ribs. Few victims remained conscious during the ordeal, whilst some died. In truth, we've probably all been party to a bit of brutality in our lifetimes, but scourging went beyond that. It is an act of unspeakable cruelty. The biblical account of this is what some would term the reserve of the Gospels, in that this act of extreme barbarism is encapsulated in one word, and no attempt is made to play on the reader's emotions. 
It has been suggested that Pilate had this done in an attempt to placate the mob who were being for Jesus' blood. Would this perhaps satisfy them without going to the lengths of a crucifixion? In a somewhat perverse way, did Pilate perhaps have the cruelty inflicted on Jesus in an attempt to save him from his fate? When the beating was finished, other soldiers present twisted a crown of thorns which they put on Jesus' head. Now, thorn bushes in that part of the world generally have long, sharp thorns which are painful enough when you accidentally touch them, let alone have them forced down on your head. This crown would have cut and bloodied Jesus' head. Every movement of his head would have caused the thorns to jag and pierce even more uncomfortably. Scripture then tells us that they put a purple robe in Jesus. Purple dyes were extremely expensive and it was therefore a color only worn by important people, by kings and rulers. And this appears to have been done to mock and humiliate Jesus. Then they got down in one knee to him, shouting, Hail, King of the Jews! Struck him with their hands and spat on him. As if Jesus hadn't suffered enough, why did Pilate allow this? Even at this stage, Pilate again makes an attempt to intervene on Jesus' behalf. He brings Jesus by now a pathetic, bedraggled, and blooded figure out in front of the mob and explains to them, here is the man. Is he in fact asking the crowd if they really believe that this poor forlorn figure could possibly be a danger to either the Jews or the Romans? Did the governor think that he could save Jesus by humiliating him in front of the crowd? Did the crowd perhaps feel a modicum of sympathy for Jesus? Well, the religious leaders certainly did not. They started shouting and screaming, crucify him, crucify him. But yet again, Pilate showed a reluctance to do this. He told them to take Jesus and crucify him themselves, although he would know that this was not possible. He found no basis for a charge against him. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, did not have the authority to crucify anyone. Only the Romans could do that. The normal method of execution for them would have been stoning. But it's not clear whether at that time the Sanhedrin had the power to pass a death sentence of any description on anyone. Pilate appears to have been trying to impress on them that he did not wish to have anything to do with the matter and that the Jews themselves should deal with it. <clears throat> the Jews, however, were determined. John chapter 19, verse 7. We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Pilate was troubled by this allegation. According to Scripture, he was afraid. In his brief acquaintance with Jesus, he appeared to be able to see something in the man which many others could not. He recognized that Jesus was someone special. He questioned Jesus further. John 19 verse 9, where do you come from? Jesus did not answer him. Pilate rebuked Jesus for this. Don't you realize that I have the power to either free you or crucify you? Jesus responded by telling Pilate that he would have no power at all had it not been given to him from above. Then Jesus said, the one who delivered me to you is guilty of a greater sin. Now, who was Jesus referring to here? Was it Caiaphas, the high priest, or Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him? 
Jesus' answer certainly confused Pilate, who by this time was feeling distinctly uneasy about his dealings with him. Pontius Pilate made further attempts to have Jesus freed. But amongst other things, the crowd were shouting to him was that if he were to release Jesus, then he would be no friend of Caesar's. Caesar was the sitting Roman emperor at the time, and the expression, a friend of Caesar, was a title which gave the holder a more favorable position in Roman society than other mortals. Academics have suggested that Pilate was an unremarkable fellow who only held the position he did because he was married to the emperor's granddaughter. Whether this was true or not remains to be seen. But if he did indeed hold the position of power only through that relationship, then he would not have wished the relationship damaged. This may have influenced his decision to comply with the wishes of the crowd. Had he not done so, any subsequent major uprising by the Jews would undoubtedly have attracted the attention of Rome and reflected adversely on his ability to govern. Pilate took Jesus outside. He made further appeals to the mob that he be set free. Here is your king, the governor said to them. But the crowd continued to shout that Jesus should be taken away and crucified. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. The chief priests answered that they had no king but Caesar. At that point, Pilate abandoned any further attempts to save Jesus from his fate and instructed that he should be taken away and crucified. All in all, a tragic outcome to a most unsatisfactory state of affairs. But where did things go wrong for Jesus? He was an intelligent man. Pilate was an educated man. Surely Jesus could have appealed to Pilate and talked his way out of all this. When things began to turn nasty in Jerusalem, surely it would have made more sense for Jesus to leave the place and continue his itinerant life preaching and teaching elsewhere. He could have made his way to the coast, boarded a ship, and continued his work in some faraway place, well beyond the reach of the Sanhedrin and of the Romans. Why did he choose to remain? In Matthew chapter 26, verse 53, when he was being arrested, Jesus told the disciples that if if he asked it of his father, 12 legions of angels would be sent down to defend him. But he didn't request this. Why? All through his mission, Jesus was aware that things were leading up to a climax in Jerusalem, which would result in his death. He was well aware that his death, the death awaiting him, would not be a swift thrust from an assassin's knife, nor indeed as the consequences of a well-named arrow. He understood that he would be betrayed by those closest to him and handed over to the those who regarded him with absolute hatred and contempt. Not surprisingly enough, the Roman occupying force, but his own people. Jesus knew what he had to face and had known since he was baptized in the River Jordan by John some three years earlier. Then there was a prophecy from Isaiah, roughly seven centuries before that. It's contained in Isaiah chapter 53 for those who wish to refresh their memories. But Jesus had taken upon himself the sins of the world, accepting what he knew that the cost would be. From that moment, Jesus had accepted the cross and so determined was he to successfully see his sacred mission through to its bitter end 
that he would allow nothing to divert him from it, neither pain nor weakness, nor even the fate which awaited him at the top of the hill. He accepted that mission for us, for all of us. He also knew that the death which awaited him was one of unspeakable cruelty, torture, and shame. He was to be stripped, scourged, humiliated in front of all and sundry, forced to carry a heavy wooden cross out of the city and then crucified upon it. He was well aware that he would be left hanging in absolute agony with nails through his hands and his feet for hours and end, being mocked and jeered at by onlookers. Jesus once said that no greater love could any man have than to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life not only for his friends, but for his enemies as well. For those who were planning his death and for those who would go on to scourge and crucify him. Even for those he knew would run away and desert him. Somehow his crucifixion was fulfilling a mission and destiny that Jesus of Nazareth initially struggled with, but finally embraced. He laid down his life for every last one of us, including you and I. Why? Because he thought we were worth it. He thought that even the likes of me, who constantly lets him down, was worth dying for. By our Christian commitment and action, let us prove him right. Let us prove to him that we are all worth it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us sing together hymn 391, hymn 391. This is your coronation. Once again, some of you may not be too familiar with it, but it's sung to the tune of the Passion Chorale, and I'm sure you'll recognize it. This day, April 3rd, all people of faith across Britain and Ireland have been asked to pray for the people of Ukraine and an end to the current conflict. This is being supported by the moderator of our own General Assembly, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, and Cardinal Vincent Nichols of the Roman Catholic Church, to name but a few. We are being encouraged to participate in a visible act of witness in our local community. We can perhaps meet that commitment by holding the ribbons that you have been given in the colors of the Ukrainian national flag whilst we pray and thereafter attaching the ribbons to the cross outside the church as we leave. Let us pray. God of power and might, we hear your promise that out of darkness, light will shine. We pray today for the mission of the church. Please give our church foresight and direction, O Lord, to follow more closely in the way of Jesus, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray that a spirit of respect and reconciliation may grow amongst nations and peoples. We pray for the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer. For those who are nearing the end of life, Lord Jesus Christ, you healed those who suffered in mind, body, and spirit. Touch those we pray for with your saving help. Sustain and support the anxious. Be with those who care for the sick and lift up all who are brought low. May they find comfort in the knowledge that nothing can separate them from your love. We pray for those who are suffering financial hardship as the cost of food rises and the price of gas, electricity and vehicle fuel spirals almost out of control. 
Bless all those whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. We pray for Her Majesty the Queen and our royal family. This weekend marks the 40th anniversary of the invasion of the Falkland Islands by Argentina. Let us pause for a few moments to remember the 255 of our service personnel who were killed in the successful operation to recapture the islands. And let us not forget the somewhat greater number of Argentinian servicemen who were killed in the process. Let us now, in a few mo moments of silence, bring before the Lord these men and any of our own concerns for which we seek help. And now, O Lord, we ask that you hear our prayer for the conflict in Eastern Europe. God of all people and nations, who created all things alive and breathing, united and whole, show us the way of peace that is your overwhelming presence. We hold before you the peoples of Ukraine and Russia, every child and every adult, we long for the time when weapons of war are beaten into plowshares, when nations no longer lift up sword against nation. We cry out to you for peace. Protect those who only desire and deserve to live in security and safety. Comfort those who fear for their lives and the lives of their loved ones. Be with those who are bereaved. Change the hearts of those set on violence and aggression and fill leaders with the wisdom that leads to peace. Kindle again in us a love of our neighbor and a passion for justice to prevail and a renewed recognition that we all play a part in peace. Creator of all, hear our prayer and bring us peace make us whole. And finally, we ask that you keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy, now and forevermore, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn will be hymn 364, hymn 3064, one you will all be familiar with, all glory, laud, and honour.
we conclude this morning's service, may I thank Ian, our organist, the ladies and gentlemen of the choir, Sarah for her excellent scripture reading, and our audiovisual team, and the welcoming party without whom the service would not have taken place. I am hopeful that as many of you as possible will come for a natter downstairs in the church hall after the service, where you will all be made welcome. The conversation is generally somewhat boring, but the tea, coffee, and biscuits make it all bearable. <laughs> May I remind you all to tie your ribbons for Ukraine on the cross outside the front door of the church when you're leaving. Please receive the benediction. May the Lord of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing, that we may flourish in faith, hope, and love through the power of the Holy Spirit. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shelter our hearts and minds. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Oh.